Hello and uh, welcome to this meeting at uh, Why Words Matter and also Why Britain Should Stop Vilifying People Seeking Refuge. So yeah, so we've got two speakers tonight. We've got uh, Julia Tinsley Kent, who is policy manager at the Migrant Migrants Rights Network and is responsible for developing and delivering campaigns, advocacy, and uh, policy activity. Uh, Julia has a wealth of experience, both professional and through her own lived experience of social justice and working closely with uh, refugee communities. And this experience is over a number of years. And we've also got uh, Javier Mamol, Rato, who is uh, best at the University of Southampton, where he carries out research on post-pandemic educational practices. Previously, he has undertaken head of English duties at Lancaster University International Study Center, as well as conducting education, educational research within EESRC funded projects, working with, with uh, working in student support. Um, before we go to our speakers, perhaps what we thought we could do is we could invite people coming in to just maybe put in the chat why you think words matter and also why you think Britain should stop vilifying people seeking refuge. Yes, so why do you think words matter? This is a question for, for you who are, who, are, who are attending. If you could put your, your thoughts in the chat, that would be good. And uh, while you're still thinking, we will go to, 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 to Julia. Thank you. Um, I hope for you can all hear me okay. Um, yes, really pleased to be here um, talking about this really important topic. Um, so as Ambrose says, I'm Julia. I'm policy manager at the Migrants' Rights Network. Uh, the Migrants' Rights Network is a UK charity that stands in solidarity with migrants in their fights for rights and justice. We use collaborative activism and legal avenues to create societal change, extending beyond the individual impacts on migrants' lives to tackle oppression at its source. We're a diverse team, uh, majority led by migratized people and people of color, essentially first and second generation migrants. But there are also um, numerous other intersecting identities in our team, uh, including religion, nationality, age, gender, sexuality, and those with disabilities. These wide ranging identities and experiences inform our work, and particularly our work on language and how we challenge established norms and narratives. For a long time, um, we've been leading the way in calling for language change around refugees or people seeking safety or a new life through our Words Matter campaign. The active demonization and dehumanization of vulnerable people is contributing to an increase in hate and division in the UK, particularly towards migratized and racialized communities. So when Russia invaded Ukraine earlier this year, the reception the majority of Ukrainians received was extremely different to the one experienced by those fleeing Syria, Sudan, Somalia or Afghanistan. And this raises a lot of questions about who's welcome in Europe and draws attention to what words or stereotypes are attributed to different groups of people arriving here. And of course, language plays a huge role in how people navigate the immigration system, how they're treated and how they are able to access essential services. I thought the best way to give you a feel for the Words Matter campaign is to talk you through some of our explainers. 
the way that we do this campaign is we use our own lived experience, the lived experience of people we work with, or things that are prevalent in the media or political discourse. We take a word or phrase and uh, explain why it's problematic and try and offer alternatives. Although the alternatives that we offer do sometimes depend on the audience that we're targeting, and I can talk a bit more about that later. Um, before I go into this, I want to clarify one term that we use at the Migrants' Rights Network. So you might hear me say the word migratized a lot. We use this word because um, we feel that it defines a lot of the people that we work with and the people in our team. What it means is it refers to the way that some people are assumed to be migrants without actually ever having been on the move themselves. So I'm going to talk through a couple of our explainers and key themes that we have covered in our Words Matter campaign. And the first one I want to unpack is this idea of economics and migration. Often we hear arguments around migration and its relation to the economy, such as the idea of contributing. The argument of migrants contribute so much to the economy is often used by those in favour of migration. But I actually want to point out why we at MRN think this should be avoided. Even though it's of course true that migration boosts the economy and we are seeing a huge labour shortages and economic problems post Brexit, it's important to remember that our acceptance of migrants should not be conditional on their economic productivity nor on what they contribute. This is because it plays into narratives of the deserving and undeserving migrant. These often have undertones of racism and xenophobia as they insinuate that someone should fit in to the status quo and these fall into preconceived ideas of whiteness, economic affluence and Christianity. We should ask ourselves what if someone isn't able to contribute or isn't considered to contribute enough? At MRM we've worked with some families who are trying to get sick or elderly relatives to join them here in the UK. Do we only accept them if they're seen to boost our economy or offer us something. We challenge these ideas because they can feed into so-called justifications for denying people refuge or respect. And this leads me nicely onto the next phrase I want to address, the phrase of hard working. We hear this term used a lot in many contexts and especially around migration. In fact, we often hear this term used by migrant groups in relation to other groups, for example, I worked hard when I came here, unlike this other group. Many seek to exceptionalize themselves and seek to portray themselves as the model migrant whilst dismissing other groups who are struggling to survive or newly arrived individuals. The language of hard working is part of an established narrative which sees the working class as lazy and combines this with imperialist stereotypes of the uncivilized and undeserving colonized. These are being weaponized as a motivation for anti-migration discourse and policies. Stereotypes around race and class are really prevalent in immigration debates. It's used as a way to demonize certain groups and feeds into the long-standing view that some do not work hard and that's why they remain in poor socio-economic conditions or poverty. For many, the hard work is to stay out of destitution and for many migratized people with no recourse to public funds, many migrants rely on their wages to sustain themselves. Lastly, the word I want to focus on is uh, the word of invasion. And I'm sure you all know why we decided to tackle this word recently, but in case you aren't aware, recently the Home Secretary use the word invasion to describe people arriving on the south coast of Britain after making the dangerous crossing across the channel. This was an incredibly dangerous and irresponsible comment to make, especially given the events that preceded this, these comments. Um, there were numerous revelations appearing in the media about the conditions at the Manston facility, and there was a terrorist attack that weekend uh, at another immigration facility. So the word itself, the word invasion is part of a large theme that has historically played a large role in immigration discourse. I'm sure many of you remember David Cameron referring to migrants as a swarm or Katie Hopkins uh, infamous cockroaches analogy. All of this language relates to the idea of a threat. 
It aligns with imagery of a battle or war and creates the idea of a con common enemy that must be fought. It gives the false impression that the host country would be overwhelmed by the presence of migrant communities. It falls into old forms of scapegoating, which aims to detract from the real issues impacting a state. A good example at the moment is the cost of living crisis. We also want to draw attention to the fact that language of this nature is often used in conjunction with images of people of colour or Muslims. Uh, I'm thinking back primarily to the uh, image that Nigel Farage used when he portrayed mainly people of colour and put the words breaking point uh, next to them. Uh, it draws on themes of the clash of civilizations and the mythology of who or what can be British. History has shown as time and time again how dangerous this language can be and the terrible consequences it can have. All these ideas, uh, as well as many other words we've tackled in our campaign, like illegal immigrant or genuine asylum seeker, are all ideas that aim to dehumanise people seeking safety or wanting to start a new life here. It seeks to put the blame on displaced people or migrants rather than examining who or what makes people flee. So there's a lot more I could talk about, but because of time, um, I'm going to just stop there for now, but I'm happy to discuss this work in more detail. And I'm also, also really keen to hear your thoughts on some of the things I've mentioned, as well as any words or phrases that you think we should be addressing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, and we, we go to, to Avia before uh, we come back to the, the, the discussion. Thank you, Ambrose, and thank you, Julia, for that super interesting discussion of, of, of language, which is what I'm going to be doing from a very different perspective. Not very different, but embedded in a more scientific approach to how I analyze language. So um, I'm going to share my screen with you, but um, just as a note of reference, my part is going to be a slightly more academic because I, I devoted four, five years of my life to studying how media uh, represents migration and is based on on a sudden the refugee crisis that most likely all of us remember. So I'm gonna share my screen with you and I'm gonna whisk through many slides very quickly. Um, but the main point is up to a certain point refuting what uh, Julia is saying from a different perspective. So just let me get slides correctly because as it is, I always do the same things. Good, so you should be seeing my slides now. If you can give me a, are you, can you see my slides at all? Ambrose, could you please let me know? Yes, we, we see them. Okay. So thank you very much. Um, and I think my, my talk really ties in or dovetails uh, to, to Julia's in many different ways because um, I'm going to be talking about metaphors and how different events can be represented in the media. And I have these two metaphors, the, the way of sorrows, which was very typical in Spain, and then the migrants pouring in as another metaphor, migrants being water. So um, my studies on linguistics, so I'm going to be talking a lot about language, but from a slightly different perspective, I'm going to introduce first the refugee crisis, but I don't think it really needs much introduction, and then I'll give you a few um, theoretical points on where, or from which perspective I analyzed um, all my data before learn, basically mm, relaying some findings and then going on to summary and conclusions. Um, I think it's very interesting that we are um, prompting already the idea of metaphors, um, but yeah, I don't think we need too much introduction for this, but um, between 2011 and up to the end of 2016, more than 5 million people have been forcibly displaced from many different uh, locations in the Middle East, Pakistan, mostly Syria, as we very well know. And um, Europe's responses, they really oscillated and we saw European countries really scrambling for making access to the different countries more and more difficult um, across the, the months and the years. Many organizations, CEAR is the Commission for the Help to the Refugee in Spain, they deemed this crisis as an actual moral values crisis. And uh, at least to know, evidently, all this crisis was embedded in the 2016 Brexit referendum campaigns. And as we were well know, um, migration, sovereignty and trade were one of the most, or some of the most political, uh, most important political drivers for this, um, for the leave campaign that would actually legitimate this toxic 
and national logic that evidently was very successful, but we are not going to get into that. Um, the UK press was very aggressive in relation to how they reported um, the crisis itself. So um, many studies have been uh, conducted in this sense, but migration figures, search and rescue aid, political responses and humanitarian issues were the most um, disconnected and important themes. Unsurprisingly, liberal newspapers, the one, that I'm going to be, uh, the one that I'm going to be talking about is The Guardian, more often attended humanitarian consents, but conservative newspapers were much more focused um, on what Julia defined before as threat, threat themes. And of course, this reflects this unsettled discourse. And we have shifting anxieties between we want to help and save refugees. And at the same time, we want to create this narrative to securitize um, our borders and all that kind of thing. So very interesting times for researchers that of course had very important effects on how we conceived and perceived migration. I looked at newspapers and the question here would be why? Well, newspapers always, and they remain still, they are really important elite social actors. Tabloids mm, reproduce um, these discriminatory practices while um, quality newspapers tend to create these um, narratives, and that's why we need to still look at them. Um, something that is really important for us to have in mind is that they are crucial players in what I call dynamics of informative convergence. So we're talking about similar topics or the way that we talk about migration. How do they represent migration? We have slightly different angles, but the angles that they tend to portray or they tend to use they tend to be overall negative. So we need to still look at them. They are really important in how they uh, communicate these ideologies. And the Sun being the mostly read newspaper in the country is a sad um, example of how language can be really important. So I looked at many different things in my thesis, but um, I looked at from the 850,000 articles that I compiled, I <laughs> reduced it to only 400, because of course there, there needs to be a, an, an end to the analysis. I looked at British and Spanish newspapers because I found that it was it would be very interesting to see how they compared. But I'm going to be focusing today only on The Guardian and The Telegraph, which for, of course are examples of liberal and conservative laden kind of like newspapers. I looked at images and language, but I also, um, I'm not going to be looking only um, at images today, but I was looking only at the elements that you tend to find in newspapers and that's where readers mostly tend to just stick to. So the headline, the subheading, the image, the caption, and the lead paragraph. These elements tend to agglutinate or to kind of like um, condense all the important information of, of news, news reports. Um, this is where it get, gets a bit more technical, but it's important for us later to understand what, what kind of things I was looking at. I was looking at how events, how a situation was uh, constructed, and I was looking at three dimensions. So motions, which <laughs> ironically the examples that Julia was giving are really close to the ones that I'm giving here. So I was looking at how people move. So another wave of migrants arriving to Kent from Calais. I was looking at action, transfers of energy, basically the, the, the canonical um, yeah, transfers of energy. So a British national attacked asylum seekers at an asylum center. Again, a very timely example that uh, Julia uh, already um, um, preempted. And then the ones that I want to focus more on is force. Examples that we have here enablement, resistance, and other common of impingements. Officers are suggesting refugees to report higher ages when they, when they arrive. This is a, a news uh, piece that was reported by The Guardian only a couple of weeks ago. The point of looking at this is that if I represent, or if I tell you a story um, in either of these dimensions, there is a kind of social intensity. So if people are coming or people are traveling, it's less intense than when they're doing something or when they are forcing or they are being forced to do something. And that was the main idea behind this selection of, of, of different event structures. And then moving on to what Julia also mentioned before, I also looked at metaphor. And for me, metaphor is very important because it's not only how we talk about something, but also potentially how we think about something. And when we see um, metaphors spread across every single newspaper outlet or news media outlet, then people are going to, on the whole, end up thinking of migrants or refugees or asylum seekers in those terms. And that's what we need to be really careful about or, or, or the language that we use. And this example from the Bank Compost, Greeks fear invasion of migrants, the same word that um, Julia was mentioning before. Certainly, this representation is creating in our minds up to a certain point, a, an idea of migrants being enemies, of being an army, of being something or someone that we need to uh, 
um, um, defend ourselves from. And I'm going to make a very quick note here. I tend to use the term RASIM a lot because it's, and this is going to make sense in a second, refugees, asylum seekers, and migrants, we tend to see all these labels conflated. You don't tend to see um, the legal definitions correctly applied. And this also has important reper repercussions because we are not really talking about the same groups of people. We have very diverse groups of people with very different legal statuses. And in as much as they all deserve the same respect and the same um, treatment, they do have different identities and they have different journeys for them to arrive to the UK, for example. And now moving on to findings, and hopefully I can whisk through this very quickly. Um, of the three areas that I looked at, the one that is the most common is force. And that is something that for us is going to have important repercussions. We're not talking mainly about people that move from A to B, which is what migration is. We're not talking about how people, what people do. Yes, we, we do see that, but the most important aspect is situations in which we have some kind of like psychological or legal push or resistance. And that basically has <laughs> ideological implica implications. And again, we have this compilation of terms. That's what I call them, or what is, uh, that's why I call this collective as a whole racism, because we don't tend to find a differentiation between who is what. They're just migrants or refugees, but it doesn't really apply correctly to who they really are. Um, motion, for example, what we see, this is like an abstraction of the things that I have found. Refugees or migrants, we see plurals. We have a group of 10,000 migrants or refugees. We see kind of like a collective, but it's made of numbers. We don't see individuals. Then we have more numbers, more than number of migrants. Then we have water or war metaphors, a tide of migrants, a wave of migrants, infamously reported by many newspapers. And then of course the illegal migrant or immigrant, the nationalities, and so on and so forth. The list um, or the label that I found the list is this of families, families, child, children, those ones that are actually allowing us to connect with them a bit more in terms of kinship, in terms of, of who they come with. Examples here, all of them um, in terms of war, <laughs> the birth of an army of dinghies, this is from advice from the Spanish newspaper, a kilometric column, heads on foot to Germany, a column of refugees and migrants. Again, we have the same um, example from the Telegraph. Infamously, they also reported in, in January of 2016, the Trojan horse. I don't think um, this mythological imbued um, metaphor needs much introduction, but of course, this Trojan horse, the refugee crisis was the horse um, on which, um, and we'll see this example later, um, ISIS or Al Qaeda, they were using this horse to basically enter as terrorists. And then we have the growing flock of, of Muslim refugees, which can have kind of like positive undertones because it's like a, a religious group, but also flock can have animalistic um, kind of like resonances for some people. So these metaphors are really important in the way that we describe the varied group of people, groups of people that were coming to, to the UK or mostly running away from um, conflicts. It's not that they were coming to the UK. The UK was one of the destinations that they, they could have chosen. Um, in terms of action, what I found is that migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, they tend to be always at the receiving end. Either they are rescued by the Greek coast guard, as you see there. They might be fired upon. As we can see that the Macedonian police was firing against them. We don't have here a specific group of people. We have more than 240 people or crowds, and that is, of course, a disorganized group of people. It's not a positive representation. When we see migrants or other collectives doing something, it tends to be in negative contexts. Like the, the, the example you have on the third line is from the Telegraph. Kale Jungle, infamously as well, of course, in 2016 and 2015, migrants are setting tents on fire. The Guardian, representing exactly the same event, decides to put the police on the agent or on the, uh, the uh, being the actor that was actually firing tear gas on migrants. So in Calais, there was a very divided representation. Um, the Guardian was much more humanitarian. The Telegraph was much more, let's say, um, discriminatory against um, the people that were trying to make their way across the channel. And of course, this has had many repercussions as um, Julia was saying before about um, the MP's words and how we're using these metaphorical expressions and the last one that I want to look at is force. I've, I'm focusing here on legal interactions. The Guardian was one of the very few newspapers that first singles out one person, a Syrian refugee, in as much as he's singled out as 
by what they do, which is seeking refuge, but is winning a process of an appeal against a forced return in Turkey. Maybe you remember that in March 2016, Europe sold <laughs> and it sold to Turkey for three billion pounds, basically for them to um, take responsibility of the outsourcing of humanitarian um, duties. And this is what the second example describes. The plan was for pit stop justice migrants detained, pushed to the asylum seeker and um, process and then deported within days. And then we have in the last example, um, the Muslim Brotherhood using migrants as an invasion force to seize control of Europe. And this is the kind of representations that the Telegraph was really, really, really good at putting forward on and on and on. I found this example many different times in the data. So force is the most important one and it encodes some kind of resistance or kind of like pushing. And we have this um, existence or influence of barriers. But at the same time, what it does is represent um, this group of people as illegitimate receivers of governmental measures, or maybe they are resistant to them, or they're instigating some kind of like, some kind of process. And that, as I understand it, is constructing these collectives as inherently negative and bringing negative consequences to the hosting societies and countries. Framings in terms of metaphor, war, invasion, and water all over the place. They have been there for the last minimum 200 years. There are many studies on, on how newspapers have been using these metaphors for a very long time. When we look at motion, people moving, they tend to, there tends, there tends to be a focus on where they arrive, but not where they come from. What are the reasons for them to leave their countries? We are always ignoring that part of the, of the event. And when it comes to action, um, people tend to be, or uh, the agents, the people doing something, they tend to be governments where um, refugees, asylum seekers, and immigrants, they tend to be patients, and their degree of agency is low, which of course reproduces the stereotypes of migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers coming to which other country and being idle, passive individuals, which we know they are not. So yeah, to conclude, The Guardian, relatively humanitarian, The Telegraph was really interestingly at the same time uh, negative in the way that they um, that represented migration. These representations did not forge at all new ways of thinking about migratory processes. And at the same time, what they did was continue to reproduce um, these negative social understandings of refugees, asylum seekers, and migrants. This is like a very, very um, dense <laughs> um, expression of, of what I found. And I hope it made a bit of sense to some of you. I'm very open to answer to any questions, and I have a thousand million more examples. Um, I hope it ties nicely with what um, Julia brought as well. And thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Javier. And also thank you, Julia. Um, I think I suppose uh, my, my, my first question to, to both of you is, uh, you know, why, why are refugees, migrants, people on the move, people seeking refuge, why are they framed in this way? Would you like to answer to that, Julia? Or sure. I, I can go. Should we tag team it? <laughs> um, so, I mean, for us, I think it's one thing to say is it's nothing new. Um, we see the way that immigrants or people arriving, uh, I mean, I guess in, in terms of Western Europe or the US, are always seen as a threat, are always scapegoated and we've seen this uh, a lot through history um, I think what I always go back to and I think the key theme is this idea of the threat and I think we can kind of see it in this idea of the great replacement theory that there is a perceived to be in the host country this sort of homogenous uh, society this homogenous culture and that that is inherently under threat by immigrants and I think it's uh to create some kind of hysteria around that and incite emotion within the host population to to behave in a negative way towards people seeking safety or seeking a new life I think it always comes back to that idea of of the threat um yeah Javier I don't know what you think I, I agree with you very much because what I tend to think when I see these representations is nationalistic identities and how we represent ourselves. I'm thinking of myself as a hosting 
society now and how we represent the, the people that are coming, right? So um, when you look at all these representations, um, you tend to find, yes, homogenous, white British society, a good society, we're doing all these good things, we are doing the right things, and then we need to create an enemy. We need to create some kind of, I mean, the, the word is a scapegoating, right? So we're not going to be looking at bad things that we do. We're going to allocate them to someone that is coming from outside. It's so much easier to tell ourselves that we are a good society by outsourcing <laughs> our responsibilities and our um, lacks to, to other people. Um, I was watching yesterday, one of my favorite politicians now is Zara Sultana, and she made a, good, a very good point. I think it was yesterday or the day before, and she was calling out, um, I think it was an MP for, I don't know what it was, but she was basically calling a spade a spade. And why are we talking about migrants taking our homes when the housing crisis has been there for I don't know how long? What are we doing with that? We're basically out allocating that responsibility to, not to us, but to the people that are coming from, from outside. So yeah. Um, and then the language itself, I found very interesting how we use these metaphors because they're really basic. We all understand that people are not water or they're not invasion, they're not invaders, but they have a lot of emotional content and, and we really feel them in a way that we maybe don't understand really well. And so we really feel them in a way that for people that don't think twice about what they're reading, it might have a lot of um, value attached to them. And I think we can continue and I guess as good as me thinking of me as part of the society now, and then everything that comes from outside, I can defend myself against them by using this language. Yeah, I think also one thing that you said that I think is resonates with a lot of the things that we've been tackling at Migrants Rights Network is this idea that we, as in like Britain or Europe or the US, have uh, kind of created this idea of us as good, that our values are the good ones and that these people from, it's normally the Middle East or Africa are have bad values and they pose, if, they, if we let these people come in, then our values will be compromised. And I think it's been incredibly acute, I guess, p particularly post 9-11, but particularly when you look at the prevent program and this uh, rhetoric we have around British values, and we hear things about British values always coming in and, you know, they lay out what these values apparently are supposed to be, but I still have very little clue about what these British values or this British culture is supposed to be. Um, and I think we see it as something that is uh, unmoving, but in fact, culture is something that's always moved it in itself is like water it's not a static thing and I think that's kind of why the focus that I think it particularly is on, on Muslims or people of colour is because they are very much framed as a threat to whatever these values or culture is and I think it's that distracting from what the real the real issues are it's a very easy scapegoat. If I can continue with what you're saying i uh, you were mentioning before the Ukraine um, mobilization of people after the, the, the war started. And I had literally finished my PhD when that started. And I started, I, I read the newspapers every day. I'm addicted to them. And I was thinking, okay, I'm going to give a chance to the newspapers to see, let's see how they represent something that is closer to us. <laughs> Ironically, well, most people that are coming from Ukraine, they are white. So when you see how the Telegraph was talking about um, Ukrainian refugees, it was a completely different story. And I, uh, my feeling was, I don't want to continue looking at this <laughs> because it's really sad to think how quickly we s switched from these people that are bringing these values. What is British culture? What are really British values? What is that supposed to mean? Um, this is a life uh, living organism. Everybody that lives in this country is contributing to it in one way or another. So I don't really understand. I mean, I understand that it is, it's called essential. Essential, I hate this word. When you make something essential, it's so much easier to, to, uh, to, to identify with it. So white British values. When you're saying British values, in, and you mentioned also the great replacement theory, you're talking, most people are actually talking about pre-post-colonialist white values. 
um, this idea of uh, the good old days, the, uh, I'm, I'm just thinking of the BNP manifestos and all these kind of like representations of this is how things were, and now we are seeing them changed. What is happening? Mm. 1960s was a very convulsive time in this country, but it was really good in many different ways. I, I keep thinking of the Windrush generation. I would really like to think what people think, for example, about how language has changed, if people have appreciated a change in language, because I haven't found it. So um, yeah, identities and how we tap on them. I think that's the, the kind of like the gist of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think on that, when again, because we're a very diverse team and a lot of the people that we that I work with have lived experience themselves and got, many of them got quite, you know, quite rightly emotional when there was the media coverage and the political discourse around Ukraine because the word, the phrase that kept appearing was just like us. And that was kind of, you know, that just for so many people was so almost heartbreaking to hear because you know that's how it was kind of justifiable well, there just like us but by saying that you mean that you're creating this this idea of the other there are certain people who are not like us and therefore not worthy of of coming here and we wrote an explainer on on that and it is yeah it's quite hurtful and I think we have to look at you know the people that I think also should say that not everyone from Ukraine was was welcome. There were a lot of people of colour who were not allowed to to come. And I think it's that idea of white, Christian, European, they're fine. But if you are not one of those, then you are not welcome. And and in, in your view, um, what effect does the... You, you've touched on this, but maybe if we could expand it on it a, a little bit. What effect does the mainly negative framing of people seeking refuge, people on the move, what effect does that have on how they are seen and also on how, how states treat them? I mean, that's a very good question because there are not many studies on how language actually has an effect on how people really think so it's, it's not that easy to measure um but i think of this as a cycle so you have who starts the metaphors who starts the representations tends to be politicians right so we have politicians making these ideas um let's say acceptable we can think of i mean for me trump in a couple of years ago was the prime example of he can say whatever and people are not going to question him but we're not talking about trump we're talking about the, the uk here and a politician is going to say something that some people might think that it's wording the voice of the people. It becomes legitimized. Newspapers reproduce it. And then people talk about migration, for example, in those terms. And then the politicians take the same ideas that they were actually propagating themselves and then becomes a law. It actually becomes part of the political system. Julia most likely has much more to say about that because she, she might be working in, in that area. But for me, from the politicians to the media, from the media to the people, and then back again. So the politicians always say that they are kind of like giving voice to the people. I think in this country, the longer I'm here, <laughs> the longer I think that is not really the case. Um, but that's my personal opinion. Yeah, I mean, I guess like what I think the, the way that people are framed and the way that language is used is it's ultimately kind of like a drip feeding effect. And I think what we are seeing is that it is justifying treating certain groups in certain ways. And I think that language has really fed into things like the Rwanda plan or the Nationality and Borders Act, the way that the gov you know, the media and ret rhetoric and the way that politicians have kind of contributed to this demonizing narrative is that we are now at a point where it is seen to be acceptable to treat some people in such a dehumanizing way that it, it's acceptable to to ship them off to a different part of the world to effectively outsource our entire asylum system or creating this idea of two-tier refugees that if you come here via one route that you are less you are less deserving of rights than someone else and i think what we you know when people say things like words are, they're just words they're not they are the very thing that forms the foundation of policies and our immigration systems 
and the way that some people like when we hear from people who've had issues with visa applications in the home office you can see that with all these different uh, routes within the home office these different visa applications that certain people are treated very differently by the home office um, and some people wait two years for their visa applications to come through and it's because that rhetoric contributes to this idea of justification that it's justified that some people are treated that way because of how they came here or uh, where they're from the color of their skin and the stereotypes that are associated with that um, and I think that's why we have to be so careful about the language we use and have to really call it out when we see it, because it, it does affect people's lives. It affects um, the way they're treated in the workplace, who can access healthcare, who has no recourse to public funds. Yeah. Um, and going back to what you said before, you mentioned that you had done a campaign on, on the term illegal migrant, yes. if I remember correctly. So I, I also looked at that in, in Spain in, back in the 1990s, and that really, really helped the rhetoric against migration on the whole, because, I mean, migration is not illegal. Like going from A to B for political or political reasons is not an illegal process. But in the moment in which we talk about people as being illegal or entering a country illegally, then you are giving this groundwork for politicians to continue doing it and then for a law to be, I mean, when that happened, as you mentioned before, the two-tier system, um, I found that inherently racist in so many different ways. So if I come by plane and I come from a different country and I have the means to actually arrive to this country legally, then I can apply for asylum or for these rights. But if I am actually risking my life through the tunnel and possibly dying in the process, then I don't have the same rights. I, I found that one of the biggest disheartening events of, of, of the decade when I read that. Um, even more, I think it was Priti Patel, the one putting that forward, wasn't she? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know, this term illegal is, is probably one of the most prevalent in the way that immigration discourse um, functions. And I mean, you know, the government kind of goes on and on about people being illegal, but is actually creating the circumstances in which someone can be perceived to be illegal. You know, the if Suella Braverman has her way that anyone who comes here not through the Ukraine, you know, the arrangement they have with the Ukraine or from Hong Kong, if someone you know, makes the journey across the channel, you're automatically considered to be effectively less human than someone else. And yet when she was questioned by the Home Affairs Committee the other day on this, you know, what if you're someone who can't walk, it, walk up to a, UN officer or you know come by plane like if, you, if that isn't available to you you're automatically considered to be illegal and she she couldn't answer it because there is you know there is no justification for it it is just completely <laughs> completely inhumane and it I think again we have to examine who who are these people making these journeys across the channel and what that says the link it has to history and the link it has to these stereotypes and what that says about about Britain and the West. And and one of one of the things that I noticed, oh sorry, you you're going to say something. I just wanted I just wanted to add to this that I find very interesting what, what Julia is mentioning, but also who in this context was making these laws. Because it's something that happens also in Spain. We have now several uh, black politicians or politicians from different ethnic um, backgrounds. And in a way, the fact that they come from those backgrounds is enabling even more this racist discourse. And I find it disheartening because I don't understand how someone that allegedly um, her parents could not have been able to come to this country on the same premises that she's actually dictating could be doing something like this. So in Spain, we're seeing the same movement. Um, I think they're using that um, outlook of some politicians as an excuse to verbalize things that are not acceptable. They're just not, they're dehumanizing them as Julia is saying they're removing, uh, they're stripping people from, the, from, from that humanity. So um, I think that move is really dangerous as well. Um, but yeah, sorry, I just wanted to, to mention that because I find that aspect especially interesting. Mm. And, and, and in your presentation, uh, you, you, you mentioned how refugee, asylum seeker, immigrant, migrant are used uh, interchangeably. And uh, Julia, you spoke about uh, 
uh, first generation and second generation uh, migrants. Uh, my, my question is around around uh, the, the, the word migrant itself. And um, in asking this question, I'm thinking of 2015, especially when uh, a lot of people were dying in the Channel Tunnel. And each time there was that death, the Eurostar would issue a, a statement or a press release saying that a migrant has died and they wouldn't give the person's name, they wouldn't give their age, they wouldn't give the country of origin, and they, you know, it was just a migrant has died. Uh, and also thinking of the 32 people who died in trying to get from the Channel Tunnel, trying to get across the Channel from France to the UK, uh, how a lot of newspapers um, uh, also describing them as, as migrant migrants. Uh, you know what 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 are your thoughts on 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 that on how that uh, is used? So I think what because when you look at these terms objectively, you know, migrant, asylum seeker, refugee, you know, all of them are at the heart of them not problematic words at all but I think it's been part of a very long campaign to make these words problematic I mean growing up you know my gram was an avid daily mail reader um, I always had that association of the words migrant were always in association with a bad word and so I think that's been part of a very long campaign because it's harder to sort of demonize the word refugee or someone seeking asylum I think they use the term migrant because of this long campaign to uh, make us negatively associate it with, with some other words. Um, and I think as well, because we associate someone who's a migrant with economics, and I think that's sort of framed in a way that's made someone seem selfish rather than they're fleeing for their lives. I think it just is, a it shouldn't be a tool, you know, my, migration is part of human history it's not a crime any of us can be migrants you know it's not a bad word but it, ha it has been made to be a bad word and therefore is used in a way that totally delegitimizes why someone wants to come to the UK and I think it's it's making those links and I think we kind of almost need to reclaim the word migrant because it's it's not a, it's not a terrible word but we have made it into a bad word over a, a series of years Very interesting. Um, I, I cannot agree more. I mean, um, we're talking about people for what they do, not for who they are. Um, I mean, I'm a migrant myself. I'm not, I don't identify primarily as a migrant. So I am many more things apart from the way or the process that I went through to come to this country and establish myself here. So when you have um, constant repetitions of the same words, I think my computer just froze. I oh, know it didn't. Um, so migrant, for example, I think is, is a primary, what Julia is saying is so true, is a neutral word. And when you look at the data in this sense, there was a very big change between the start of the, um, of the refugee crisis and the end of it. So at the beginning, asylum seekers, refugees, those words were used much more. And at the end of it, the word was migrant. And that is sort of also a movement within the newspaper world, because they were saying, um, this word is kind of like connoting some kind of like right. If I'm a refugee or I'm an asylum seeker, then I have rights. But if I don't, if I'm a migrant, then that's something that I'm doing. And as Julia is saying, it has this negative connotation attached to it. And um, also, when you say migrant or migrants, we tend, we tend to see those words in, in plural quite a lot. And you don't see one individual, you just see a group of people and they're all the same. So when you don't see who people are, you cannot empathize with them. Um, if I told you Island Kurdi, we all most likely know that name because of the tile that was washed up in Bodrum Beach in Turkey in 2015. But if you didn't see that name and you didn't see that photo, you wouldn't be able to connect with that tile directly. So those emotional aspects of representation are really important because if we are not allowed to connect with them as people, we are not going to legitimate or legitimize the basically them being here. Um, 
I think you are very right, Julia, when we say when you say that we need to reclaim the word migrant. Um, I was giving a lecture on Tuesday to 110 students, and I told them we are all migrants here. There's nothing wrong with that. We, I'm an economic migrant, if you want to call me like that. I'm an academic migrant. I'm a personal migrant. I'm many different types of migrant, but that's not who I am. That is something that I've done. And when people start reframing that word, then they can also own it. So I think there is a level of empowerment in reclaiming that word, definitely. Hmm. And, and, and this one is for you, Julia. You know, going back to first generation and second generation uh, migrant, wouldn't you say that there's an exclusionary logic in that, in that phrase? Because some of the people who are being called migrants are actually, were actually born here and are citizens, and yet we, they are still thought of and spoken about as migrants. Yeah, so that's why we use the term. We not, normally when we write things, we say migratized and racialized because absolutely, you know, people were, you know, they were born here. They have exactly the same identity as, as me in terms of citizenship and nationality. But the way that I am perceived as white British compared to someone who is a person of colour or an ethnic minority is very different. So we use the term migratized because there is that distinction in how they're perceived. You know, the CEO of our charity, um, she was born here, she's born in Surrey. Her parents came uh, from Pakistan, but she could, you know, the way that she navigated living in Britain as a person of color is entirely different to how I navigated it. Even though we were both, you know, have British passports, we're both British by birth, but that's why we use that word. Um, because yeah, I think it is all about that intersectional identity. And, and unfortunately we don't live in a society where just, you know, we're, we're all considered the same. And then uh, at this point, I think we, we open it up to uh, the people who are, who are listening. Uh, does anyone uh, have a question? Uh, oh yes, we've got one from 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 Yana, Yana, would you like to say your your question? Uh, hello, hi, thank you for uh, having me here. Hello, uh, Ross. You know, so um, yeah, just a very interesting discussion. Lots of things not to to uh, add. Just question to Julia because it's a new thing. You know, so how would you call uh, children of Ukrainian immigrants? You know, migrants, you know, refugees now. So because they're not Russianized. You know, so that's just a question. Yeah. Yes, so I mean, I mean, one of the things that I would say is I would ask, so you have to look at how like the media and politicians call them. And then if I wanted to say, actually, you know, try and uh, talk about them in, in like a, a give, like denote a word to them or whatever, I, I would actually like try and try and ask them what they, they wanted to be called. Um, I think rather than making assumptions on what I, as someone who hasn't got that lived experience of migrating or fleeing uh, a, a war or a persecution, I would ask them what they, they wanted to be called. I guess if I were writing about, you, I mean, when I have written about Ukrainians, I say people that refugees from Ukraine, people who fled the Ukraine, and I would probably say at the moment until we see, you know, Talk, you know, talk to some Ukrainians or see some further analysis on on how the media talks about them. I would say children, or, you know, the children themselves are also refugees and displaced people. Um, but I think, um, yeah, I think I think that's kind of where we are at the moment. But I mean, I would say as well that when we make this distinction between like Ukrainians and everyone else, that's not to say that Ukrainians aren't also <laughs> experiencing a lot of difficulties. Um, you know, they were, there has been, there have been differences, but, you know, when I was growing up, certainly there were people from Eastern Europe were incredibly demonized, um, Ukrainians included. And I think also we have to, we have some concerns in the sector about, you know, the visas and protections that the Ukrainians have been given very reluctantly by the UK government. The, I don't think the UK government was very keen to welcome them at all, but I think we have to ask ourselves what happens to the Ukrainians when those visas run out or when the, the hostile environment 
policy starts affecting them in the same way that it's affecting people from a multitude of other countries, you know, Sudan, Syria, you know, it could, could easily, I think it's, we use that distinction when we're talking about race, but I think it's important to, to not kind of say that they're all fine when actually they're facing a lot, a lot of issues. But yeah, so it's a very long winded way of answering your question, but yes, I think there's a, there's a, there's a few things there. Yeah. And, and th there's a question from uh, Prince, uh, Prince Chooks. Uh, Prince, would you like to say your question or would you like me to read it out? Could you read it out, please? Okay, so the question says, uh, don't you think that Europe is the architect of the proliferation of undocumented immigrants crossing the channel? And uh, the case study that Prince gives is the assassination of uh, Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein. And this is for, for both of you. I mean, that's a very difficult question because I mean, when people ask me, what is the cause of mass migration? I always go for climate change and capitalism, because for me, they are the, the core of everything. Um, I, don't really, I don't really have um, a background on, on politics or, or history to really make an assessment on <laughs> if the, the assassination of Gaddafi actually made this happen. But maybe I can transport an example which is a bit closer to what I actually know, which might be what we were mentioning before, Ambrose, the situation in, in Morocco. So. For many of you, you might not know, Spain has two autonomous cities in the north of Morocco. They are Melilla and Ceuta, and they are literally a, a, they have the biggest and most expensive fences system in the world. No, not many people know these things. And so only three months ago, um, literally before Libya almost had a fight with Morocco because of the gas and everything, because we get all the gas in Spain from, from, from Morocco and from Libya. Um, Basically, Morocco opened the gate, opened the, the 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 fences, or they tried to open the the fences with Spain. Ten thousand people came through in the space of two days, and twenty five people got killed um, between Spanish and the the Moroccan border. And still, is something that is being assessed by by people that work on on law and things like that. And um, so, this proliferation evidently is something that is at fault both on Spain and on Morocco. I don't think we can point fingers at a specific actors, because at the end of the day, the people or the societies that are receiving migrants or refugees or asylum seekers and the societies that are creating these fluxes are both to be, um, up to a certain point, blamed for the situations that they're facing. So Morocco, evidently, for having the human rights violations that they have systematically, and I don't want to go too much in that, and Spain for trying to basically pass it down back to, to Morocco, which we've been doing it for 25 years at least. So um, I wouldn't call it architect. Uh, this figure of architecture, um, I think politicians are to blame in many different situations, but it's also true that, or well, I would like to think also that is true that um, how countries portray themselves in many different ways kind of like attract um, people. And at the same time, People are just trying to have a better living. I don't think that we are uh, here, nobody's here to be exempt of, of any guilt in this situation. Um, but I don't really think that Europe is orchestrating this um, proliferation of immigrants. Um, they are to blame for many different reasons in many different contexts, but I wouldn't think that what we are seeing in the UK is primarily a um, European problem. I wouldn't think so. But that's my very humble opinion without any pol politics or law background. Um, I mean, I certainly agree. I mean, you know, climate change, I think, is only going to become, you know, a bigger and bigger issue. I think that's one of the issues I have about when people, uh, politicians talk about, you know, we've got to tackle small boats. You know, it's not something that can be like done, solved, tick. You know, people are going to keep fleeing because the world will become more and more um, unhabitable and I think you know we need to address climate change I think in terms of I think there's two things here that I really want to address is when we talk about uh you know we have this uh demonization of people fleeing certain parts of the world 
And I think it's no coincidence that a lot of these places were also areas that were colonized. I think imperialism and colonization has a huge, huge part to play in why people flee. Um, I think also sometimes we talk about, this is my personal view, we talk about empire as if it's a thing of the past and I don't, I don't think it is. Um, you know, we only have to look at the vast number of Western interventions that have been in the last 50 years, it's been a lot in my lifetime. Um, and also as well, you know, you, you, you can't colonize the majority of the globe and oppress their people and take their wealth. And then, you know, when people flee, you know, I, I just don't think, I don't think that's a coincidence. And we often talk about the role that colonialism played and also the role that colonialism played in a physical sense, but also imperialism in the way that it portrayed people, you know, it portrayed certain areas of people and areas of the world as uncivilized and, um, and we still hold those views today. I actually wrote my university dissertation on how the colonial views of people from certain areas of, of the world still inform the way that the media and politicians portray people today. Um, also, one thing I want to mention, and this is something we've talked about in our Words Matter campaign, is we all hear the terms refugee crisis and migrant crisis. You know, they're things that I've said in the past as well um but actually something that we've started to kind of say in this campaign is we should move a little bit away from that because we should say refugee policy crisis because by saying refugee crisis or migrant crisis it kind of puts the blame and emphasis on the people fleeing like it's their fault they're the people to be blamed when actually it's a huge number of other issues we don't have safe routes it's the history of colonialism um western intervention our immigration systems, Fortress Europe, it's, it's, you know, we don't have policies in place. And as Javier said, climate change is a huge issue and it is only going to increase the number of displaced people and we need to put those infrastructures in. But it is a crisis of policy that has created this situation. I think it's an, you know, I could go on for a long time about, <laughs> about all of this, but, but I won't. But I think there is something set to be said there for for the role that Europe has, has played in, in um, continues to play in, in why these people flee and the lack of support and infrastructure that exists to, to help these people. And, and, and Prince, is there, would you like to add something or you know, comment on the responses? Yeah, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to comment. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we hear you okay, fine. Cool. Yeah, um, first of all, thank you for, for the answer you provided. The reason why I mentioned the um, Gaddafi and the um, Saddam Hussein, um, Saddam Hussein is that most of East African or people from Africa, when, when Gaddafi was alive, the economy of Libya was okay. Nobody was crossing the channel because after Europe was also paying some money to Gaddafi to make sure that people don't cross in the 80s. So until, until Gaddafi developed their places, so they, I think Perawa, in, when the Gaddafi was alive in 2006, before then, Perawa there, just one, one hour job is $15. So people have job, had job, but when the Europe decided to destroy Libya, then Libya was in crisis. There was nobody to checkmate what is happening. In fact, immigrants are being auctioned and sold for sale in Libya up to, up to today. So had they been, Libyan economy or Gaddafi was not killed, I don't think the African immigrants will be going to Europe for anything. Secondly, on the issue of Saddam Hussein, the same thing happens. A lot of immigrants from Iraq crossing, every people go there and crossing because Saddam Hussein wasn't there. So all these things were caused by the politician. So, and this politician, they held from Europe because they want to control people. On the issue of, um, finally, on the issue of of climate change, I don't buy the idea because if you if if you remember, there was a flood that ravaged people from Pakistan, and when they check their record on the on the emission and all the all the rules that you know that people are people are saying that causes um, climate change, those things are not in place in Pakistan. So how could you say it is a climate change? Every problem is not being given to climate change. I don't believe in climate change; it's just a nature. So climate change is being used as a school to generalize everything. 
So that's my contribution on that. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Prince. Um, I don't know, Julia and uh, Javier, do you want to say anything in, in response? Sure, I can answer very briefly to that. Um, I mean, if we use the example from Morocco and Spain, I think it's very similar to what you're describing in terms of Saddam Hussein and, and Gaddafi in, in Libya. So Spain pays a lot of money to Morocco every year. So they are kept there, as it were, as you're describing, for example, the role of Gaddafi uh, with Libya. Um, it's every single time that there's some political conflict between Spain and Morocco that Morocco uses people as bargaining chips and is doing what they do. We have now, I don't know how many thousands of children that crossed that day only a few months ago, literally scattered across Spain because they came on a, prim on a promise that nobody knows why they're here. So that's one thing. Um, so yeah, politicians always have, I mean, politicians in this case, we're talking about dictators. We're not really talking about politicians in the same level. Um, and I agree with you um, up to a certain point in what you say about climate change. It's not an excuse, it's, it's a factor. I don't think it's the, uh, something that is just um, the perfect um, excuse to attribute to all these processes of migration, no, but it's going to increasingly contribute to people's mobilization. It's not that they are just, yeah, um, as you said, Pakistan is not, doesn't have these measures in place. Yeah, that's not really going to stop that the world is changing the way that it is as fast as it is. Um, it might be one of the factors contributing to people mobi people's mobilization, not only the one, not the only one, but I think we're going to see that factor becoming much more important in the decades to come. Sadly, if we don't establish policies to either regulate climate change in the way that we need to regulate it, if we have time to do it, and at the same time, as Julia was saying, we're living a policy crisis. In my talk, I had refugee crisis in between inverted commas. It's not a crisis of refugees. It's a crisis of how we handle the mobilization of people. So we need to start thinking about how we are going to give space and resources to the people that are not going to stop moving between places. That's not going to stop. Um, in terms of politics, um, I just cannot really speak too much about that. Thank, thank you. Um, I don't know, Julia, did you want to add anything? Uh... Yeah, I mean, I, I would certainly echo, echo what uh, Javier said about uh, climate change. I think it's that, you know, when is it, this is going to get worse and we are seeing the effects of it start, uh, particularly in recent years. And I, I think it is only, only going to increase. Um, I think there is something, um, Prince, about what you mentioned about um, with your examples of Libya and, and Iraq. And I remember reading a few years ago that one of the, the patterns that, you know, West, when there was been Western intervention or European colonialism, one of the factors that have played out again and again and again is that, you know, the European powers would go into a country, very little understanding of the people, uh, the economy, the culture, you know, and for example, when they went into Iraq, they knew, no knew nothing about the country and, you know, that contributed to a lot of the mess that they're in, just that lack of understanding. And I think we can also see that on the, the borders in Africa, the way that those maps were drawn up and very little understanding of the people and the cultures and the languages that, ex that existed um, in that space. So I think there, there is something to be said on, on that. And we, we've got another question from, from Nicola, Nicola David from uh, Ripon City of Sanctuary. Uh, Nicola, would you like to ask your question or? So, so the question um, that's here is, uh, do you have a sense of comparison in, hmm. across history? In, in the language that is used to talk about, uh, you know, people on the move and also people seeking refuge. And the examples Nicola gives um, are Huguenots and also um, the migration that was caused by World War II. Um, I, I do have a couple examples or, or data in that sense because two of my colleagues were looking at historical data. so. Charlotte Taylor from the University of Surrey, for example, she has studied the representation of, of, of the same groups that I have studied in, in the, the newspaper, The Times, across 200 years. And she found pretty much the same patterns. So we are talking about 
metaphors or ways of talking about um, uh, migration that date to back to colonial times. Um, so this demonization is embedded in the political and the discursive system in one way. That's for for the times, for example. But um, one of my colleagues, she's, she, she was doing history, but she was looking at uh, newspapers in the early 20th century, right before the, um, the, right before the First World War, and she found the same metaphorical framings. So it's not something new. Um, in my field, some people ask themselves, is this the natural way to actually talk about these people if we are using the same words and the same ways that's talking about them for hundreds of years? No, <laughs> this is a political. One of the um, uh, contributors in, in the chat mentioned um, that every word has a value or there is the words carry an act power. Well, who are the people behind all these massive or mass representations? The people that have the money, the people that have the capital, the people that actually want to con control the way that we are carrying out our lives. So this is not something new. And sadly, it's not something that unless we do something about it, um, we're going to continue perpetuating the same um, practices. Um, Prince Chuck mentioned in the chat as well that the word or the terms illegal immigrants is not longer used. It's not longer used in the same way, but we see a transition from one word to another. So it's not that we are not talking about migrants in a negative way. We might change the word, but we are literally, we are doing something quite similar in a slightly different sense. And in the in, media are really good at that. They start using one term, crisis, the refugee crisis. We had never heard about, um, it was always humanitarian crisis until 1998, 2000s. And then when we've seen people literally in the millions moving between countries, we started seeing the word crisis more often. Um, where do we allocate the value of that crisis? That's, I think, what the gist is. So history tells us we are repeating the same mistakes all over because until very recently, we haven't had participatory media. We're not really asking the people who are being represented what they think. That's something that in the, in the chat was saying. Um, if I, can I go to that question, Ambrose? Is that okay for you? Yeah, yeah, sure. So there was one question talking about um, perception. Um, sorry, I just missed this. Yes group reception, how do these groups view these media responses? They don't align with it. I'm pretty sure that Julia has much more to, to say about this, but my colleagues or people that are researching this kind of topic, how do refugees, migrant and asylum seekers feel about the ways that they are represented by in the media? But they don't represent, they don't represent themselves like that. There are people like you and me, they don't think about themselves as migrants. <laughs> they think about themselves as Julia, Ambrose and Javier. We are not here, you know, like, allocating ourselves the value of something that we do. So um, the point here is that if we enable people to actually say who they are, I think what you mentioned before, Julia, shall we ask the children from Ukraine how do they want to be labeled? And that's something that we can do now that before, maybe 100 years ago, we couldn't do it because people didn't have the power to actually speak up. But now we're seeing a transition to more participatory media. So I think it's very interesting. You have uh, in Italy, there are several very um, high profile migrants that have come from Libya and other countries and they have a very big voice. So that's what we need. Uh, I think we need migrants that are much more empowered um, to define who they are, if they want to be defined or not. Hmm. Um, and, yeah, Julie, go on. I was just going to, yeah, echo, echo what you said really. I think there's, um yeah asking people how they want to be perceived and I think something again that we're always conscious of is that a lot of the times you can you can see in lots of migrant communities and the example I used of hard working sometimes groups will pit themselves against each other rather than and this is not just exclusive to migration you know it plays out in a lot of other areas that they'll pit themselves against each other rather than actually looking at the the root or the source or whatever system is is contributing to their experience um and i think again with, with javier what you were saying about you, the words they've changed but the sort of meanings attributed to them have sort of gone along with them and i think we won't really you know we can tackle one word and say that word's no longer acceptable but there will just be another word to come along to replace it but i think it's 
getting to the root of why these words are problematic. So looking at history, looking at the I, the role that identity plays within them, looking at examining, you know, why why are these words being used? What are they allowing to take place? What are they contributing to? And yeah, asking asking people about their experience. And at MRM, what we do is when we, there's a lot of organizations that say they work with migrants or work with refugees. We work in, with them, but we treat them as partners and as experts. We don't treat them as test subjects or you know boxes to be ticked. We work with them and we hear what their stories are and what their experiences of dealing with this rhetoric and the you know, racism in, in many forms is and use that to kind of work together to find solutions to to the many problems facing facing them yeah thank you and uh, we, we go to to Alison and uh, and Diana you've got uh, comments in the chat uh, Alison so we, we start with you would you like to speak on on, on those Hi. Yeah, I mean, I guess um, it was in answer to the question right early on, um, but I really, really valued um, this discussion. And I think some of um, some of what's really struck out at me is kind of checking my own language and how I've fallen into using those discourses um, that feel like it's helpful, feel like it's positive, as in kind of, you know, kind of that people bring a lot to our society and our communities and how that's problematic and thinking about how that's used and I really valued what you said Julia about kind of it turns the focus away from the problems and the problems are huge and broad and they're uh, about structural oppression, they're about structural racism, historic oppression, they're about whiteness, they're about really complicated geopolitics that are about maintaining the status quo and language I, I work in psychology and kind of language I'm acutely aware of how it's used to problematize and pathologize individuals and locate problems in individuals rather than and it it's intentional isn't it that it keeps us from looking at the political power above us that has so much more influence over us than anything inside us and partly i'm thinking um about you know media and political discourse is all about sound bites and headlines and summarizing things very neatly because we're all kept very busy and we don't have time to read and think about things in a nuanced way. And I, I was wondering partly, are there any examples of public spaces where we're getting this right, when we are being able to speak to those powers where, um, you know, where we're not getting drawn into um, these really unhelpful discourses that, that just serve the status quo and keep us all pointing fingers at each other rather than the politicians. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I don't know, uh, Javier and Julia, do you want to, to respond to Alison's views? Such a good reflection. Thank you very much, Alison, for that. Um, um, I mean, I think one thing that we have now in 2022 that we didn't have like 100 years ago is social media. So um, now we have a place that actually gives voice to people that would not be given a voice before. So. Um, if you post a piece of news on Facebook and you are the Telegraph, chances are you're going to see someone contesting the representation of reality. And that is something that now we're seeing more and more often. Uh, one of my <laughs> um, pastimes of a Saturday is reading the sun and have a look to see what people are talking about. And the Express are my favorite ones. And it's very interesting to see how people engage in, in the comments section. So we're seeing people actually contesting those representations much more and more often than we saw before. Um, they're also moderated. So there's a lot of filtering on how these things work. Um, it's a big question what, you, what you're asking there. I think giving voice to, to the actual actors um, and protagonists of these processes is, is super important, uh, not only by relaying what they say, but as Julia was saying before, by making them participants of their own process, um, 
Newspapers don't tend to do that. Newspapers tend to use elite voices to represent how things are. And very, in very few occasions you see people actually represented for who they really are. So I would like to see newspapers giving voice to, to individuals much more often. Um, but I think social media can be operationalized in that sense too, or instrumentalized to, to, to bring the person to the fore. Um, it's very new. I think if we wait a few years, we're going to see that those things happening. And I'm pretty sure that, uh, I mean, if you want to look at activists that are really important in, in, in on Twitter, for example, you have Rihanna Walcott. She's a, a amazing researcher from, from uh, in London, actually. I don't know where she's now in UCL, I think. And she's been talking about the black Twitter and racial, racialized uh, people on Twitter and how Twitter can be very different depending on your on the color of the skin. So um, I think there is a lot happening there. And I think what we need to give is like a um, to amplify those voices because they're there, but the means of production or you know like the the, the status quo still largely preserved. We're gonna see that that changing. I really hope. Maybe Julia can tell you a little bit more on how that might happen, but yeah. Yeah, I think it, it is starting to happen. I think there are like, you know, social media is a huge, huge tool. I mean, you know, if you think back to June 2020, when George Floyd was murdered, you know, would that have had the reach that it, that it did if it hadn't been social media? No, you know, it's given people a platform to speak truth to power, I think what concerns me is if we look at like where all the statements that came out in June 2020 of all these people saying they were going to do X, Y, and Z, well, actually, where are we now? A year, however long it's been, two and a half years later, you know, it's, it's very, very slowly moving. Um, but I think, yeah, those, those people who do have the ability to kind of platform their experiences and platform things that are happening to them in you know incredibly incredibly quickly um I think the also as well I think sometimes we hold up the charity sector as like a model of how things should be and I'd actually kind of caution against that because there are a lot of very you know good things happening in the sector but I think also we you know we have like how you, you were saying there are kind of those voices that speak for for everyone and there often actually aren't the voices of people being affected by certain issues or certain societal problems and i think we are starting the sector is you know bringing does bring those people in and it brings those voices in but i think actually it's one thing to kind of use those voices to highlight an issue and actually then put those voices into positions of decision making and positions of power and be able to influence the the thing the decisions that affect their lives I think it's not for example you don't want to have like a lived experience role you want lived experience embedded into things and it is slowly starting to happen but very very slowly um so yeah I don't <laughs> I don't have loads of examples of how things are uh spaces where those things are are happening but I think we can see the we can see slow change but I think it's holding people to account for when they make grand statements or you know say that they're going to challenge the way that that they use language I think yeah it's, it's holding people people to account for it Think, oh, yeah. Sorry, yeah, um, you're going to have to shut me up in a moment because it's sparking so much in my brain, but I think, I think it's, yeah, and I think kind of solidarity is so important, isn't it, because it's a really interesting case about um, the Black Lives Matter movement and um, how much of a swell that had in terms of um, pushing f things forward, so our CEO of um, Leicestershire Partnership Trust um, made some really powerful statements about um, our trust becoming anti-racist and, and speaking back to kind of structural racism. But when Black Lives Matter started talking about social justice and um, social change and that we need to think about capitalism and we need to think about the status quo, the media and the backlash about that was immense and suddenly they were being vilified and I think kind of so many narratives got squashed so many voices got kind of erased from that and that's the risk isn't it kind of when when it's not political power that's being affected to make change that an enormous amount of solidarity has to take place because there will be a pushback and 
certain groups in our communities um, become so much more impacted than others when when political power is being um, asserted. It's yeah, yeah. Thank this you. is a this is a space of solidarity, I guess, too, isn't it? This is these spaces like this, I think, are really important. And I will Thank be you. quiet now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Thank you. Um, how how about you, Yana? Hi again. Hi. Uh, yes. Uh, so I would probably jump on something you know that uh, Javier was talking about just a moment ago. So uh, I'm coming from performance studies field, you know, so which is quite different to other fields because we're dealing with uh, personal stories, right? You know, so and actually it's quite interesting to listen to people on the call because. Um, very often in performance studies field, you know, so we don't see the big picture. We see like those personal stories and emotional stories, and we kind of focus too much on those. You know, so the conversation between the fields is needed. You know, so and uh, I, I think that one of the things which is interesting. Um, the other thing um, I was thinking about because I've been working on the subject performance and migration uh, for years. And in fact, it started with the conversation of performance and exile, which the term which is not used here in this conversation at all, right? You know, so which is very much about personal experiences, which very much is about political um, dissent, you know, and so on, and dissidents and, and so on. Um, with time, so I think the field moved, you know, into migration, then, they talked, then we started talking about refugees. And I think what important is to now really talk about um, colonization and the way you know Julie you mentioned you know the thing that when we're talking about colonization we're talking about the past but it's not true right you know it's actually in the present and going back to the Ukrainian refugees you know so this is another example of colon colon colonization and action right you know so the invasion the Russian invasion is colonization and action right you know so and some kind of a, a one of the worst, like bad forms of this um, expansion and so on, expansion of the empire. So I think that to me, you know, so talking about migration, um, the, the, the really the triangle, which I think is very interesting. So there are a couple of triangles, you know, so one of them would be uh, migration, nationalism, and climate change, and then the way that we talked, you know, so there's those the factors, you know, in play and how they um, sort of influence what we do, how we think about things, how we present them. And then if we think, for example, in, I'm coming from Canada, in Canadian context, for example, also very interesting because there is also indigenous people, right? You know, so and the reconciliation that didn't happen or is trying to be happening, you know, right now. So the triangle is a little different, you know. So we're talking about migration, indigenous uh, issues, and national sort of tendencies and nationalism, you know. So I think that those uh, big terms and big thoughts, you know, are important, you know, for the movement of the field. I'm not sure if answering to anything which was before it's more uh like um whatever response you know so i'm kind of providing to, to the conversation um and in all these cases you know language is the the vehicle right you know so it's it's it, language is the vehicle for legislations you know for you know the way the governments, the states regulate people, but it's also um, a vehicle for exchange, right? For communication. And again, you know, so for this, for the performance studies field and for theater specifically, it's very interesting because what we do, you know, we challenge the hom homogeneity, homogeneity and the hegemony of the state by providing many languages, by speaking, you know, in different languages on stage simultaneously. So. Um, that's that's the thing. And the last one I think you know was interesting is to talk about um the changing face like of the nations, right? You know, so and again, you know, so kind of going back to the question of second generation, third generation, so on, you know, so how do we um define you know what nation is today, you know, so be it Britain, be it Canada, be it and, and other place. So I'm just giving you <laughs> a project <laughs> describing the project i've been uh working on for the last couple of years but um yeah so those those are the questions you know so the triangles and connections you know that come to my mind yeah thank you for listening gosh you've been very yeah. really nice thank you thank you thank you very much thank you all for for, for attending um 
uh, the, the event today. Uh, the event is part of the Leicester Human Rights Arts and Film Festival, which itself is starting from the 4th until the 10th. Um, please, you're welcome to, to join us for those events as well. You can find details about them on uh, Facebook, on Twitter, and also if you just uh, search uh, Leicester Human Rights Arts and Film Festival. So thank you all for, for, for coming and uh, hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambrose, for having us here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.